evening or good morning to all the participants joining from different parts of the world. Uh, my name is Nuria Pratt. I'm responsible of the research development and innovation area of the Pau Costa Foundation. And today I have the pleasure to moderate this webinar. First of all, I'd like to mention that this is the last webinar of the PCF webinar series that started one year ago. The foundation launched this initiative uh, to share fire knowledge from around the world. Every month for the last year, we have had experts sharing perspectives from different regions. We started with Argentina, then UK, Portugal, Siberia, Chile, California, Greece, Indonesia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Australia, Ecuador, and today this tour ends in Canada. So we have the pleasure to have a panel of Canadian speakers today. They are co-authors of a paper that was recently published in the Canadian Journal of Forest Research, consisting of a synthesis of fire science in the last, 20, uh, last 50 years. Sean Kogan is a postdoctoral fellow with the Canada Wildfire at the University of Alberta. Laurie Daniels is a professor at the University of British Columbia. And Jean Park is a fire and vegetation management specialist at Parks Canada. Before the presentation start, I would like to remind some housekeeping rules. Please use the Q&A tab to send questions. We'll gather them and uh, share them in the Q&A session after the presentations. And um, the webinar will be recorded and will be available in the Pau Costa Foundation YouTube channel um, later. So with all that said, Sean, um, the floor is yours. Okay, hi, thanks for the introduction. Uh, just let me load my presentation here. Okay, I trust that you can all see this. Okay, yeah, thanks everyone for uh, attending. Uh, and uh, uh, like Maria uh, said, today we're gonna be giving a, a kind of a talk about a, a recent paper that we published in the Canadian Journal of Forest Research. And- uh, Sorry to interrupt, we, we can't see your slides. Oh, you can't. No. That's because I didn't press share screen. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Yes, we see the PowerPoint now. Okay, okay, awesome. Okay, yeah, so there was a number of different uh, co-authors on the paper and uh, everyone had their various expertise, but uh, today we're lucky enough to uh, to have a couple of them with uh, present with me. So first I'll just uh, give a, a kind of a basic introduction to wildland fire in Canada, just update you on the uh, situation here. And then uh, Laurie is gonna talk a, a bit more after that about uh, fire ecology, uh, fire regimes and uh, forest management issues. And then after Jane is gonna uh, give a talk about uh, fire management in Banff National Park in Alberta. So uh, wildfire is a, a pretty uh, common occurrence in Canada. It's been a persistent feature of the, on the landscape for uh, millennia. Uh, so on average in, in Canada, there's 1.96 megahectares per year of area burned. And uh, the majority of the burned area occurs in uh, the boreal and taiga forests in Canada. So on the right there, I just put a, a figure from a, a recent paper by Haynes et al, uh, Fire Regime Changes in Canada over the last half century. And uh, you can see that they, there's the burned area polygons they put on there. And as well, they've overlaid uh, uh, these different ecozones, which if you don't know, the ecozones are kind of ecologically uh, similar regions. Um, and uh, basically this band of uh, burned area that you can see across the country is kind of overlapping the boreal forest area of Canada. Uh, quite importantly in Canada, uh, uh, you know, the, the extremes are, are driving a lot of this area burn. So, Approximately 3% uh, of, uh, of fires are responsible for greater than 97% of area burned. And this these typically occur on these uh, the extreme fire weather days where we're getting these hot, uh, dry, windy days. And, and um, some people have called these uh, spread days. Oops. 
So uh, the various different ignition sources in Canada are probably uh, similar uh, around the world as, as lightnings and humans are, are, are causing most of the fire ignitions. Um, so each of them, in, uh, just across the country, uh, is each uh, different uh, ignition source is causing about 50% of fires. Um, however, lightning is responsible for a far greater amount of area burn. So it's responsible for about 90% of the area burn, while, while humans are responsible for the other 10% of, of area burned by wildfires. And part of that is uh, the spatial distribution of, uh, of fires in Canada. So lightning fires, uh, typically, uh, they can be more common in the north and they might be uh, harder to be detected. And, uh, and uh, sometimes they'll just let these fires go for uh, ecological or, or cost reasons. Um, and human-caused fires were, are generally more common in the southern parts of Canada, uh, generally where more people are, are living. So uh, actually, I just pulled some data from the Canadian National Fire uh, Database, and I just plotted uh, just uh, the uh, point data or point data for for uh, fires of all sizes from 2005 to 2019. And even without a base map on here, you can see that uh, there's quite a few more uh, lightning caused fires in the northern parts of Canada. Uh, and this is just to show uh, uh, kind of the relationship uh, where you see that these human caused fires and actually where humans are. So on the left hand side, you can see that the, there's a, a figure from uh, Johnson and Flanagan in 2017. And you can see that most of the, the populated centers in Canada are in fact in the southern parts of the country. And a lot of these areas have a, a high amount of wildlife or uh, urban interface areas where, as in them as well. And on the right hand side, you can see that there's also a, a just generally showing the wildland urban interface or wildland human interface areas in Canada. So they, while they are predominantly in the southern parts of the country, you can see that uh, it is creeping northward. Um, and I thought actually uh, I'd uh, just show some results uh, from an analysis I recently did. So on the left-hand side, uh, we have a, a map of Alberta and BC. Uh, just put the road layer on there, and as well, we've got uh, different population centers classified by by their size. And uh, so, and on the right hand side, we can see how the uh, these fires are human caused fires are clustering in in British Columbia. So, as you expect, you can see uh, what I actually did. I used this uh, machine learning algorithm called uh, HDB Scan, and what it does is instead of uh, just partitioning all points into a single cluster, it'll actually it pulls out the high density areas. So you can see where the, the highest density of wildfire, human caused wildfire ignitions have been occurring in the province. And you can see that they're closely tracking uh, roads. Um, uh, if you can see my pointer here, uh, so these black points, these are points that aren't part of a cluster. They're called negative one. But uh, you can see around uh, Vancouver Island into Whistler, there's a cluster, also a cluster outside of Vancouver. Other areas with uh, high population uh, and uh, a lot of outdoor activity is the Okanagan Valley here. And I think that's also home to Canada's only desert ecosystem. So not, not they get a lot of fire activity in that area. But there's some other interesting uh, areas as well. For example, this area, uh, the purple cluster is uh, around Fort St. John and that's actually kind of an oil and gas uh, region. And we might have some other areas that are, uh, I think associate, might be associated with uh, First Nations uh, reserves, for example, around uh, Smithers here can be uh, something as well. So basically where, where people are and where people have access to is where the, these human caused fires are, are happening. And I just thought I'd throw this in just uh, just for contrast. So lightning caused fires in, in both BC and Alberta, obviously not, uh, not just showing up where people are, but uh, probably more related to the distribution and uh, receptivity of fuel, as well as the, uh, the occurrence of lightning in the region. And uh, importantly, uh, not just the, the spatial differences in um, human versus lightning caused fires in Canada, there's also per, uh, distinct seasonal differences. So across the country, uh, human caused fires tend to occur in the spring, uh, while these lightning caused fires are tending to occur in, in the summer, which is quite short in, in Canada. So June, July, and August. Well, these human caused fires, the bulk of them in the country are, are occurring in May, it, it looks like there. So the, this figure is what I actually did here is is just for, I put plotted the number of fires that occurred on each day of the year from 1959 to 2018. And these are fires relatively small and all the way up. So greater than or equal to two hectares. And you can see across the country for, for fires of this size, it's about 52% of them are caused by lighting and 48% by humans. 
But this is uh, also quite spatially variable as well. So, for example, in the, the Monte and Cordillera ecosystem that uh, in British Columbia and Alberta's Rockies, you can see that there, there is the spring peak in, uh, in uh, human caused fires. There might be uh, some kind of smaller peaks in August and uh, in the late fall, but most of the lightning caused fires uh, that have occurred there have occurred in August. And uh, this is, a, again, an example of uh, uh, an area where there's actually more human caused fires than lightning caused fires. So there's about two thirds of the fires here are caused by, by humans. And another example of the boreal plains where I am here in Edmonton is quite similar uh, to the, the national one. I think it's uh, spring caused fires like mostly occurring in May and then uh, kind of a June, July, August uh, lightning caused fire season. And uh, as far as trends in wildfires of going, there's uh, there's been a few studies that have showed, uh, that have looked into this. So for example, in the national nationwide, uh, there's uh, evidence that the, in, there's been increases in the area burned by wildfires. Uh, there's been increase in the number of large fires. There's been increases in, in fire season length and, and increase in the, the size of large fires. But on the, uh, on the other hand, there's been a, a the trend in human caused fires is actually showing there's a decline in, in human caused fires. And of course, these, uh, because Canada is so big, it's, if you don't know, Canada is actually the second largest uh, country in the world by area, second to uh, Russia. So th there's actually, we do get a lot of seasonal or differences between different parts of Canada. So uh, regional studies have, uh, have found again in Western Canada, the, the increases in, in area burn, number of large fires uh, and lightning caused fires. As well, uh, there's been uh, some recent studies uh, showing Arctic's, uh, in the Arctic that lightning is actually increasing there and also lightning caused fires in some parts of uh, the Arctic. And for human caused fires, again, uh, regionally, they're, they're either decreasing or they're stable. And there's other, uh, there's other studies too that looked at different regional transfer. For example, season length in Alberta and Ontario have been shown to be increasing. And on the right-hand side is just, uh, again, some figures from Haynes et al. that just kind of illustrate the, the variability and when where th things have been uh, ramping up or, or declining. So you can see kind of Western and uh, uh, Northern Canada there, it has been showing some increases while kind of Southern Ontario and Atlantic Canada have been showing these kind of decreasing trends. And as far as climate change goes, uh, Actually, uh, Canadian uh, wildfire scientists have been at the, the forefront of climate change since the uh, science since the 1990s. So this is a, I just took this table from a paper we did earlier for the scientists warning people. And um, basically, uh, uh, there's been a, these climate change wildfire studies have looked at how, how climate change is going to affect wildfire and a, a number of different fire regime metrics. So, for example, uh, climate change in, uh, impacts on fire weather. Uh, increasing fire weather, uh, increased fire danger rating in, in, air, in some areas, increasing area burn, uh, spread days, which are those periods of hot, uh, dry, windy weather where the, the fires uh, really grow on, uh, as well as uh, climate change effects on the intensity of fires, season length, uh, the number of lightning caused fires, uh, the size of fires, the occurrence of frequency of fires, severity, and uh, fire media, media ecosystem change. So. So the ability or how, how wildfire is going to, uh, to mediate the transition to different vegetation communities with, alongside climate change. And again, there's a, uh, the observed trends that I mentioned uh, previously. And again, I thought I would just uh, uh, show some figures to illustrate this, because uh, if you say, you know, things are going to increase, it's not, not the same across the country, right, because of the variability. So on the, on the left-hand side, I've just shown a, a figure from uh, Wang et al., 2015, where he's just uh, for, or projecting the, uh, the the increase in spread days up to 2090. So you can see quite a bit, uh, there's a, the variability, but again, there's showing increase in these extreme fire weather periods uh, in kind of the Western and Northwestern part of the country. And similarly on the, on the right-hand side, a uh, paper by Mike Flanagan in 2009, just showing the relative change in, in fire occurrence between future and baseline scenarios for both human and lightning caused fires. So again, uh, uh, looking at uh, increases over a lot of the country and uh, with variability in, in different areas. And uh, I thought I'd also just touch on some recent uh, noteworthy fire events in the in uh, 
in Canada, and mostly uh, you've probably noticed I've been focusing mostly on Western Canada because that's what I'm more familiar with. But uh, in, in 2016, you may have heard of uh, the fire in Fort McMurray, which was uh, also known as the Horse River Fire. So this was the, uh, the costliest disaster in, uh, in natural disaster in Canadian history. So with insured property damages of, of over three and a half billion dollars. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, private dwellings were destroyed in, in this uh, fire. And uh, they evacuated, I think, basically the, the whole town. But, and I think really there's only one road in and out of there. So it was, it was quite a, a difficult situation. And again, in the following uh, uh, years, 2017 in, in British Columbia broke uh, area burned records for that year. And then the following year, 2018, they smashed those records again. Um, I, I, uh, again, quite expensive, a lot of, uh, of residents evacuated. I think uh, Lori's gonna talk a bit, about, a bit more about that in her talk. Uh, but one thing I wanted to highlight was uh, uh, the smoke transport. So I think uh, these fire seasons really uh, high, uh, brought to the forefront the, the issue of wildfire smoke. Uh, uh, so in the bottom hand uh, corner, you can see just uh, smoke plumes from uh, BC just wafting over and just hanging over Alberta there. And the air quality was quite bad here. In fact, it, it was uh, affecting uh, Eastern uh, Canada and US. And I think, uh, they, they, not I think, but I, I saw that the smoke transport was even transported to Europe. So you guys, I don't know, maybe you were even smelling that. And I think uh, we also were, during those years, I think we were also uh, smelling smoke from Siberia as well. So I think it brought to the forefront this, uh, uh, the issue of that wildfire can affect, uh, through wildfire smoke can affect uh, uh, people far, far away from, from the actual wildfire source. And the more that uh, people are looking into uh, smoke, the more they realize just kind of how nasty it is for our health. <clears throat> And just a little bit more about the, the Fort Mac fire. So this was a fire, it was a, a spring fire, it was detected on the 1st of May, 2016. Uh, they think it was human caused. And it kind of occurred, I think, uh, during a good storm of events. So basically for conditions. So but the previous winter and autumn were, were dry. Uh, there was very little or no snowpack at that time. What was happening uh, the, in particular was there was this hot, dry air mass uh, just hanging over the air that set record-breaking temperatures for that time of year. So the figure I have on here is uh, from the NSEP, um, from NSEP temperature anomaly in Fahrenheit. And I just put a little star at the approximate location of, of Fort McMurray in Alberta. And you can see that the temperature anomaly is like on the order of, of greater than 30 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than usual for that time of year. So in fact, uh, this uh, event was actually associated with an anomalous weather pattern. So uh, basically there was a strong stationary uh, long wave upper ridge uh, and it was associated with these hot and dry conditions. And uh, these are known as blocking ridges. And they, they also we can call it uh, omega blocks because the, the shape of the ridge sometimes looks like the, the Greek letter omega. Um, anyway, they can, these can persist in area for seven to 10 days or longer and um, uh, this, uh, you can see from the figure on the, the right, that's a 500 millibar or hectopascal uh, geopotential height uh, figure. And the, the, you can see it's just uh, been, I can't, I don't know the exact day or time that this is, but it's during that same uh, event and just sitting over the province there, or provinces. And um, they, they think that these actually may increase in Western Canada with climate change. So for example, uh, uh, these ridges becoming uh, more persistent, uh, you know, over BC, California. And um, some people I think uh, were speculating they might, e might even be um, like a, a long events. So basically, but uh, I think there's more research being put into that sort of thing. So in general, uh, Canada, Canadians are, are kind of, and firesighters are kind of saying, you know, expect uh, respecting future with more fire and um, uh, will we'll likely need to adapt to, to, to that uh, scenario. And um, yeah, so th I, that's uh, where I'll leave it for now. And I guess I'll, I'll, I'll let Lori take over from here. Thank you, Sean. Um, so let me continue on the theme that Sean has just raised about those blocking high pressure systems and their influence on fire. 
2017 and 2018, as he mentioned, were record-breaking fire years in British Columbia. Over 1.2 million hectares burned in both years. They cost $1.2 billion to unsuccessfully put out these fires. We had tens of thousands of people evacuated. And in both years, uh, British Columbia was in a state of emergency for several weeks. In both of these years as well, blocking high pressure systems um, created hot, dry conditions that led and contributed to these fires. There we go. Um, so here we are in 2017, and I want to focus on these fires in particular. The three fires labeled at the bottom um, burned collectively um, over 500,000 hectares. And what was shocking to us is not only were they burning under extreme fire weather conditions, and so here you see the fire danger kind of heat map. The reds show extreme fire danger, orange high, and you can see all 94 million hectares of British Columbia in August of 2017 were in um, moderate or mostly high to extreme fire danger. The fires that were burning in the southern portion of this map shocked us because they burned in areas that extended from bunch grass ecosystems to um, through lower montane dry forests up into um, in upper montane forests. And these forest systems have abundant fire scars embedded in the trees um, within the landscapes, and yet the fires were burning at very high severity and really changing the composition, the shape, and the trajectory of these forests. So why might that be the case? Obviously, fire weather was an important factor. But I also want to point out that we've had a legacy in, in British Columbia, as well as other parts of Canada, of fire suppression to protect lives and homes, but also our livelihoods and the forests, given that the forests are such an important portion of the economic um, basis for British Columbia. In British Columbia, we've become so successful that in recent decades, over 92% of fires have been put out before they reached four hectares in size. And that fire suppression effect is having cumulative impacts on the forests and their state and their burnability. So what does that mean? What are the consequences of these shifted fire regimes? Surface fires, the lower intensity fires that burn through the understory of these drier ecosystems um, and limit the accumulation of fuel have been effectively eliminated. They are the easier, easier ones to put out. Um, they're less vigorous than crown fires and they're the ones that have, have largely become absent from the forests. We have evidence of past surface fires embedded in tree rings and the disc on the right is showing a Douglas fir tree that has been burned twice over its lifetime and then had a long period during the 20th century with no fire. I want to show you a summary chart from some work that one of my master's students has done in this uh, south central part of BC. This particular research forest is right in the center of that area that burned so vigorously in 2017. We were lucky, however, that our research forest didn't burn. In this study, Wes has put in a whole series of plots, 30 plots, each represented by the horizontal lines. The length of the lines tell you about the lifespan of the oldest trees, and along each line where we found a fire scar indicating a past surface fire that scarred, but the trees survived is indicated by the black triangles. We also have white and gray triangles indicating cohorts relating the fire, or the fire relationships to forest dynamics. So let me show you the whole fire chart now. For all 30 of the sites in Wes's study area, he documented 23 fires over multiple centuries with the fires ending in 1943. Fires used to burn on average once every 15 years in this landscape. And yet it's gone several decades, um, almost 70 years, in fact, without fire. The last major fire um, was in 1863. And if you look at the age structure of the forest, we see that over 78% of the trees in this forest regenerated after that fire and then have persisted in absence of surface fire in subsequent um, decades. 
The last part I'll add to this figure is the intervals. The longest intervals at each site, individual site, ranged from 20 to over 110 years. The red bars are showing the time since fire at each of those sites. And the time since fire ranges from 70 to 140 years. Again, these are sites that used to burn at intervals of about 15 years. So we've missed multiple fire cycles. And as a result, the forest is in, has increased in density, increased in ladder fuels, and has become more susceptible to high severity fire. So what does that look like when we look at the landscape? Here we're looking at an aerial view of a, a dry forest ecosystem in southeast BC. When surface fires were common, um, grasslands and woodlands dominated. That's the light gray in the photograph. In absence of fire, exclusion of fire, we get a shift with trees encroaching into those grasslands, increasing the fuel loads, and ultimately reducing the resilience of these ecosystems. When we add in climate change, we're seeing in our dry forests of Western Canada, these large, fast, intense fires that are a result of these combined influences, climate change and forest and fire management that has led to fuel buildup. So here we are again with the Elephant Hill fire from 2017. It burned almost 200,000 hectares from grasslands to upper montane forests, largely at high to moderate fire burning through parts of the landscape where trees had historically experienced surface fire. We call this the fire suppression paradox. The paradox being we've tried to protect our forests from disturbance and fire, thinking we were doing a good thing. The paradox being we've actually created a situation that makes the landscape more vulnerable to fire. Fire is also interacting with other aspects of forest health. So fire suppression has homogenized our landscapes, creating broad landscapes that are susceptible to insects, like the mountain pine beetle, which has affected 19 million hectares in um, British Columbia and spilling over across the Rocky Mountains into Alberta. We're also seeing in these landscapes both the changes in forest structure, but also our management responses to salvage the timber, but leaving behind residual wood that's very burnable is contributing to these fires, their spread, their intensity, and their impacts. So if I summarize then, both our surface fire regimes and the crown fire regimes, the forests that were affected by mountain pine beetle typically have a crown fire regime, both are being affected by climate change and fuels buildup linked to human activities interacting with climate change. That's leading to a change in the fires, which tells us we need to change the way that we are managing. And these changes need to be adaptation to both our wildfire and forest management to increase resilience to both the ecosystems and our human communities. This mural depicts an ega, or the era of mega fires where we have these large severe fires um, in part contributed by suppression We've had our landscape level um, management focused on timber, um, contributing also to suppression. We have, as a result, communities that are very vulnerable to fire, but are also resistant to mitigation, not understanding the risk that they're facing. And in part, that's because our citizens are kind of naive to the risks and hazards around them. And without citizens asking for change, there's been a lack of political will to address these important issues. So how do we transition from an era of megafires to coexisting with fire? To be resilient, we need to adapt. We need to diversify fire management, allowing managed wildfires, reintroducing prescribed fires in the appropriate places and times. We need to focus not on timber production, but landscape resilience using science, evidence-based and tested methods. We need to think about proactive planning around our communities, mitigating fuels, and maybe looking for ways to link to bioenergy to look for carbon trade-offs as well. And of course, we need to educate, um, engage and educate our citizens. And we do that through the Fire Smart Canada program. So this is a whole suite of activities 
that we might undertake in Canada. And I want to pass the, the torch now over to, um, to Jane to illustrate some of the really amazing adaptive um, fire management that has been implemented in our national parks. Jane, we see your screen, um, but we cannot hear you. There may be a problem with the audio. Yes, these all these things always happen when when you are alive. <laughs> it's not working. No. Um, perhaps if you uh, log off and join again. Let's see. Yeah, perhaps it's a good moment for participants um, if you have questions to share with the speakers, with Sean and Lori. Um, there's the Q&A tab where you can send your questions and um, um, we'll collect them and, uh, and share them for the Q&A session. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Jane. Yeah, we can hear you now. Sorry, yep. I have no idea why that happened. I will share my screen again. Okay, can you hear me and see my slides now? Yes, <laughs> everything. <laughs> Great, okay. Um, so I just, I'll follow uh, Lori's lead here and talk a little bit about how we're using some of the strategies and tactics she talked about within the National Park. Um, I wanted to first acknowledge that I'm joining you from Banff National Park, which is within the present day territories of the Treaty 6, 7, 8 nations, as well as the Métis homeland. And we recognize that the lands and waters of Banff have been used by um, Indigenous peoples for sustenance, ceremony, trade and travel for millennia. And we thank them for their continued uh, stewardship and sharing the land with us. So for those of you who are um, unaware of where Banff National Park is, we are in Alberta and uh, we are along the Canadian Rockies, um, east of the Continental Divide. Uh, we were the first national park in Canada, second in North America, and, and third after Yellowstone. Um, we're a UNESCO World Heritage Site established in the late 1800s, and we cover 1.64 million acres or 0.66 million hectares. Um, the fire regime in Banff, we are within the Montane Cordillera uh, that Sean spoke of, and um, though we're in somewhat of a lightning fire shadow, 
um, where a lot of the lightning strikes actually hit rock rather than vegetation, um, as documented by Wachowski in uh, 2002. We have evidence from over 400 known Indigenous archaeological sites that suggest that Indigenous people have inhabited or traveled in the Banff area for nearly 11,000 years. And fire history research by uh, folks like Tandy, what Hawks, White, Lewis and Ferguson, and others has shown that cultural burning by local Indigenous peoples in the dormant uh, seasons was uh, prevalent across uh, this area. And uh, they were using cultural burning practices primarily for the maintenance of travel routes, medicinal plant um, propagation, and wildlife habitat. Like Lori mentioned, um, in, in many places in North America and all around the world, um, park establishment and, and the settlement of, of uh, colonial folks really meant the exclusion of cultural burning practices um, and, and increased fire suppression technology. And uh, Cliff White uh, did a synopsis of kind of fires uh, following the railway. And, and uh, we, though we had some large railway fires at the turn of the century, uh, the Park Service, which was primarily founded on fire suppression, got really good at putting fires out. And in this figure, you can see that at the, the kind of turn of uh, the late 1800s, when the park was established, we still did have quite a number of fires. Uh, some of those fires were railway fires. Um, but then as you proceed over the decades into the 40s, we've essentially eliminated fire from the landscape uh, through fire suppression. This little blip here in 1968 was the Vermilion Fire. It started in the Vermilion Pass area in Kootenai National Park and it spread into Banff National Park. <clears throat> and it, it spread to about 2,400 hectares. And it really stimulated a, diff a change in, in perspective on wildfire. And as the uh, native vegetation grew back, there were a series of studies in the uh, mid 1970s by Parks Canada scientists and others that recognized uh, that fire wasn't a destructive force, but rather a regenerative process on the landscape. And it really started to change the way Parks Canada thought of fire management and that fire may be a natural and necessary process on the landscape. Um, and papers by Dubé and Harris in the 1970s started to shift that prevailing thought. Um, and then further research uh, by Ben Wagner and others uh, kickstarted a lot of fire history and fire regime research in the area to de determine you know, the most appropriate strategy to restore fire to the landscape and um, started to really recognize the significant impacts that fire suppression were having um, on the landscape. And it, it led to Parks Canada recognizing that just fire suppression alone um, in, in combination with things like uh, logging were unlikely to maintain ecological integrity in these areas. And so you can see on the map there, the extent of that fire uh, in the Kootenai, National Park area spreading into Banff. And here are just some photos from one of the early studies looking at uh, vegetation regrowth following that fire. So in 1983, uh, prescribed fire program started within Parks Canada. It started at a very small scale near Two Jack Lake within the park, um, only about seven hectares. And, you know, the Parks Service really started to change its policy um, and started to actually require active fire restoration um, throughout the 80s. And now, you know, that program has grown and has become much more complex in terms of being able to implement um, prescribed fire at multiple scales, you know, adjacent to communities, adjacent to transportation corridors. Um, and and uh, most of our applications of prescribed fire you know, our uh, multi-ecological objective, but also to reduce wildfire risk to our communities as well. Um, the paper by Cliff White here, um, which is kind of a synopsis, uh, really is one of, one of many works that was completed, you know, throughout the 80s, all the way into the 2000s by uh, folks like Cliff White, MP Rougeau, Dave Gilbride, Mark Hescott, uh, Charlie Van Wagner and others um, that really tried to get to the, the basis of what our fire regime is in our area. And um, several studies have, have looked at what that is and, and we have a really good idea of the, the natural fire regime in our area. 
And that's the basis of our foundational uh, fire management policy within the park. And so while we recognize that we still um, need to protect the public and infrastructure in our communities, we do recognize um, that we play a part in uh, forest resiliency and ecological integrity. And uh, in 1996, the Bow Valley study, uh, which is this paper here, um, verified that fire suppression had negatively impacted the montane and subalpine vegetation. And additional studies um, by Cliff White and others on trophic relationships between predators and herbivores um, and how they interact with fire and vegetation communities kind of furthered our understanding of fire as a natural process. And so shortly thereafter, um, in the late 90s, a target was uh, set to restore 50% of the historic fire cycle within the national park, um, which represents approximately 1,400 hectares annually. So you'll recognize the left side of this graph is the, the, the figure I showed earlier. Um, and again, you can see uh, the Vermilion fire here, which still was preceded or um, followed up by a lot of fire suppression. And then you can see where our first prescribed fire was in 1983. And since then, through a combination of prescribed fire and uh, managed wildfire, we've managed to reintroduce uh, fire back to the landscape. Um, a couple key locations that uh, we kind of highlighted in our paper are areas like the sawback range that you see here. Um, this area underwent uh, repeated prescribed fires starting in the 1980s, and, and this last photo is from 2014, where the park has reintroduced fire to reduce the amount of um, dense, lo mature, logical pine forests. Um, and through repeated prescribed fire, we've been able to restore really important montane and Douglas fir grasslands. Um, these areas are extremely important to the wildlife in the area. But as you can see by the change in the fuel, um, where this would be what it would have looked like before, um, these types of prescribed fires um, also assist with wildfire risk. This particular area is just five kilometers up, upwind of the town of Banff. Um, another significant prescribed fire that happened in 2003 was the Fairholme prescribed fire, and it really was a milestone within the program with respect to the complexity um, and, and scale at which it was uh, implemented. One of the main objectives was to reduce mountain pine beetle uh, habitat, so a lot of logical, mature logical pine that had um, various levels of mountain pine beetle in it. Uh, and it was extremely complex. You can see here the Trans-Canada Highway, which is the main transportation corridor across Canada. Um, you know, shutting that highway down actually results in millions of dollars of economic loss to the country. Um, we receive, you know, 4 million visitors a year within the park. And this fire is also just upwind of the town of Canmore and the community of Harvey Heights. And so um, there are a lot of lessons learned that year. 2003 was a particularly difficult fire season in Western Canada. Um, we experienced 42 days of, of uh, dry, dry weather, uh, no rain, which resulted in, in significant smoke impacts to the area, both from wildfires in BC, but also from this fire. And the lessons that we learned from the fair home with regards to mountain pine beetle habitat management, um, smoke and community protection and communication are still being applied to um, prescribed fire management within Parks Canada today. So our, our program has evolved and now we are using prescribed fire and active fire management um, or what we call modified response or managed wildfire um, to allow fire to play its natural role on the, in the ecosystem. And there's a, a lot of research going on looking at interactions between things like um, white bark pine. You see in the left hand corner, um, the, the need for fire for uh, habitat re regeneration and, and uh, restoration of wet bark pine. Um, we also have reintroduced bison into uh, the park and a significant portion of that project is the maintenance of grasslands and, and uh, meadows, as you see in this, fire, or in this photo here of a prescribed fire we did in the Panther Valley. Um, and we've also had other research uh, studies looking at the impacts of grizzly bear forage, and um, habitat um, associated with fire and uh, fuel management as well. And, you know, 
like Lori uh, and Sean alluded to, with climate change, we recognize that things are changing. And um, this bottom left-hand panel here just shows the increase in wildfire season in Banff, um, you know, from 2041 to 2070. And in certain places in the park, our wildfire season can increase anywhere from 20 to 40 to even 60 or more days, which is, you know, a couple months of extra fire season. Um, those kinds of things really uh, create uh, vulnerability in our communities. And um, we need to work on, on fire management at the landscape level to, uh, to protect our communities and uh, maintain eco ecosystem integrity. So we recognize now that with an ever expanding wildland urban interface and increased visitation to Banff, that we have to couple prescribed fire where we can put it with strategic mechanical treatments. So here we've got um, the 400 or 300 hectare um, Carrot Creek uh, fuel management. It's a mechanically logged area that was subsequently burnt. And this is the fair home here. Um, the community of Canmore is just outside of this photo. And we do plan to reburn this area in the next couple of years. So pairing, you know, mechanical treatments with prescribed fire and managed wildfire um, and backing that with science. And so this right hand panel here is from some uh, wildfire risk modeling work that the Canadian Forest Service is doing. Um, and you can just see uh, the varying wildfire risk around the community. And, and we pair that with fire smart treatments and uh, prescribed fire on the landscape to increase that resilience um, to the impacts of climate change on wildfire. Um, and then this final panel here showing um, black, uh, some Blackfoot uh, Indigenous people uh, lighting cultural burning on the landscape, you know, working with Indigenous people on fire stewardship and guardianship of fire on the land will help to promote kind of long term resilience at multiple scales uh, for both the ecosystem resilience to climate change and it'll allow fire to continue its role as a natural process within the ecosystem. And um, that's all I have. That's kind of a, a synopsis of what we're doing in the National Park. And I just want to, um, from Lori and Sean and I, thank uh, the rest of the co-authors on the paper, uh, Dan Boychuk, Phil Burton, Mike Flanagan, Sylvie Gauthier, Victor Kafka, and Mike Watton, um, as well as all of the fire researchers who've contributed to fire research in Canada over the past 50 years. Thank you very much. I'm muted. Okay, thank you very much um, for the three presentations. Those are fantastic. Um, perhaps now if Laurie and Sean, um, you want to turn on your cameras as well. Um, we have a few questions already in the Q&A uh, uh, tab. Um, we invite the uh, participants to send more questions. Uh, we have a few minutes for that. So there is um, one first question uh, from Abraham. Thank you so much for the presentation and mentioning that in Spain, the two main aspects that explain this era of mega fires are mainly the climate change together with the abandonment of rural areas. And finally, both mixed with the fire suppression paradox. How important is the abandonment of rural areas in the case of Canada big fire problem? Um, I'll go ahead and comment on this and then maybe um, Sean and, and Jane might have additional comments. Um, in British Columbia, we don't have abandonment of rural areas being a major issue. Um, I would actually say that part of, um, part of our um, wildfire situation or concerns are the expansion of wildland urban interface, more people arriving into communities that are based in very fire prone areas, and then um, urban development without necessarily having um, been cognizant of the fire risk and hazard around those new neighborhoods. So we have um, people who don't understand fire moving into neighborhoods that might have been built in a very fire prone environment without careful consideration of how to configure roads and um, access in and out egress from a potential fire situation or necessarily using fire smart principles when building their homes. 
So a little bit of a different situation in, in British Columbia and um, other places that I'm familiar with across Canada. Thanks, Laurie. Um, there are a couple of questions for Jane as well. Uh, one is from Marty Alexander. Do you feel that the BAM town site is fire prone now? Um, yeah, so thanks, Marty. Um, I do not feel that the BAM town site is fireproof now. Um, I think we've come a long way um, from, uh, you know, the last 30 years with uh, my, the work of my predecessors, Cliff and, and Ian Pengelly, um, starting like a lot of fire smart work and prescribed fire in the area. We've continued that with some more mechanical um, treatments in the last couple of years, right up wind of town. Um, first of all, it's, I think there's a lot of maintenance to be done on the work that's been done over the last 30 years, but there still are um, certain areas that are more vulnerable um, to the town site. We are just fully embedded within the dense forest. And so, you know, trying to make up for a um, couple hundred years of, of sub fire suppression and, and building into the interface is, is a lot of work. So I think there, we've come a long way, but I think there is still quite a bit of work to be done, um, both from just kind of the physical aspects of fuel management, but also in terms of our own preparedness and, and ed residential uh, education um, so that people are more fire smart. Um, the town, town of Banff is doing quite a bit of work on the fire smart side of things, um, but there's still a long way to go. People really love their, you know, wooden homes and they like screening and they like trees. And so um, that's, that's still a big issue here too. Thank you, Jane. Um, second question about uh, Banff Natural Park is, uh, what are some average costs for uh, hectare per, for prescribed burning? Yeah, I, it can really vary. Um, some of our large prescribed fires in the back country where we don't have as many values at risk, um, they can be really quite cheap, you know, a couple hundred bucks a hectare. Um, you know, you need a helicopter, some uh, aid, uh, aerial ignition device ping pong balls and a couple of crews and you're you're good to go and you're done in a couple couple days. Um, but then there are other ones where we're doing it in more complex areas like the Fairhome or right around our boundary with the town of Canmore where a very small prescribed fire, so we had one at Carrot Creek um, 2012. Uh, it was only about 55 hectares, but it was about a thousand or almost $2,000 a hectare uh, just because of the complexity, the level of values at risk in the area, we're right adjacent to a community. So it varies a lot um, by the complexity of the burn. So um, in some cases, it's it's way cheaper than, you know, other fuel management, though you don't get the return in terms of uh, resource extraction. But in other places, it um, can be really expensive. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. I'm, I'm trying to connect. There are many questions now, so I'm trying to connect them a little bit. Um, there's one about the, um, how do you manage burn logs? And, and this could be Jane or, or Laurie. I guess in the I'll answer it quickly for the National Park. In the National Park, we do not do any salvage logging or anything like that. Um, because fire is a natural process here, we do allow the the burnt trees and the snags and the, the coarse weedy debris to play its role in the ecosystem in terms of habitat and nutrient cycling. So uh, we don't do anything kind of after after fire. We might burn it again a few years later, but um, that's kind of what we do here. But I'm not sure somebody, Laurie, wants to talk about the industrial forest. Yeah, in the portions, and I'll, I'll speak to British Columbia because it changes from province to province and up in the territories um, in Canada because the forest management is at that scale, provincial scale or territorial scale. So the rules in British Columbia um, on the timber harvesting land base, the component of the land mass where we are um, actively managing for timber, which is a large area, over 60 million hectares where we extensively manage for timber, um, salvage logging would be very common, especially if it's if the sites are close enough to a mill to make it cost effective to remove wood or burn trees um, from the forest. And so that is extensively um, practiced and is of concern when you start acting or, or superimposing multiple disturbances 
on one another. And so there's active research to try to understand those impacts, especially given the large areas burned in 2017 and 2018. Thank you, Laurie. Um, there is another question for you. Um, we hear a lot about the environmental pros and cons of bioenergy. From a wildfire perspective, what are some key opportunities or scenarios for British Columbia where bioenergy can be used in combination with proactive planning can help British Columbia adapt to wildfire? Um, thank you. So there's a couple different ways that we've been thinking about bioenergy potentially being um, a portion of, of or, or um, contributing to um, the interconnectedness of different aspects of our management as we think about fire risk and hazard. Um, so in British Columbia, again, when we harvest any small residual wood that is not going to go to a mill to be produced into a, a finished product, is often piled and burned on site so that we reduce the residual or the amount of fuel load for potential wildfire, um, but it's too costly to take that, um, that material and transport it to a location where it could be used for bioenergy. Um, there's serious concerns about that because it's contributing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Um, it doesn't always reduce the risk and hazard to the degree that we would like it to. So that's an opportunity where um, bioenergy could in fact um, become a greater contribution in terms of our forest management. So finding ways to make use of that biomass more effectively um, is a key component. And that plays out as well when we're talking about um, fuels mitigation. When we're going into those forests that have had trees encroach into them and densities are higher, when we're cutting and reducing the amount of trees and fuels, we're cutting the smallest trees, the ladder fuels, the trees that have encroached, we're leaving the large fire resilient trees behind. Those are important for the ecosystem, for wildlife, and, um, and are the ones that are fire hardened or resistant to fire. So when you remove all that small biomass, it's not um, going to produce wood products the way our timber industry would typically do. And so again, finding ways that we could use that biomass that we're removing to reduce hazard, um, finding a way to potentially transport or transmit it into um, a bioenergy cycle would be another way that we could potentially benefit. Thanks, Lori. Um, we have a couple of minutes left and a, a few questions. So. Um, here, there's one for Sean. Uh, I see that you all include fires with a size larger than two hectares. Um, I know from initial attack experience, we, we get lots of fires in Alberta that are, that are actually kept under two hectares. Lots of small lightning stars that are um, actioning, uh, actioning quickly. How do you think this could affect the uh, starts on human versus lightning causes. Hi. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I chose the, the two hectare size is uh, a lot of the papers before they're looking at larger fires, so 200 hectares or larger. And basically the data for that, for those fires are a bit better going back in time. So um, I tried to, uh, to make a, a bit of a compromise. I think uh, 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 the provinces collect data differently and I think uh, in uh, previous uh, time periods, for example, some some areas would, would count campfires and smaller fires like that. So it was a bit of a, of a, a trade off. We're trying to, to to look at smaller fire size, but not get too small. Um, but uh, I did run the analysis on all fires. And in fact, uh, the proportion of fires uh, for all fires, the human caused fires go up. So th that's the short answer there. Thanks, Sean. And um, thank you very much, uh, the speakers. Um, we don't have time now for more questions, but I suggest that the few questions that um, uh, have not been answered, they are posted on the website um, in with your answers. And um, with that, I'd like to wrap up the session. Um, and this is the end, as I mentioned, of the PCF webinar series. All the videos of the series uh, are available on the Pocosta Foundation YouTube channel. And um, 
we also want to make a small announcement that is the foundation will soon start a new knowledge sharing initiative called Café Sospeso. Uh, so stay tuned because soon we will share some more information about it. And with that said, I want to thank once more the speakers for sharing your time and knowledge with us. And also thanks to all the participants that have been with us today and uh, also during the whole webinar series. Thank you very much and see you soon.